your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to preach a message this morning. Don't get over it. Don't get over it. Revelation chapter 2. Let's see if we've got these reading spectacles. I want to see if they help me. Oh, brother. <laughs> they do. <laughs> All right. The Bible says in uh, Revelation chapter 2, where we're starting verse number 1, the Bible says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not uh, bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you would help us this morning not to leave our first love. And if we have, that we would return. Oh Lord, we don't love you. We didn't love you first. You loved us first. For God so gave. So for God so loved that he gave. Heavenly Father, I think all you want from us, a lot of people think it's um, a bunch of do's and don'ts. But what people don't realize is that the do's and don'ts are a lot easier to do and a lot easier to avoid from doing if we love you, if you have our heart. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us this morning. Talk to our hearts, speak to us. Convict us where we need it, encourage us where we need it. Teach us where we need it. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak to you this morning. On don't get over it. Don't get over it. Now the book of Revelation, of course, was written by the Apostle John. John on the island of Patmos. He was exiled there. The Romans tried to um, kill him uh, like they did all the others. Uh, the Romans didn't kill all the apostles. They, they were killed on different continents by, in different times. Uh, but the Apostle John, they tried to uh, boil him in a vat of boiling oil, and it didn't take. Um, the Romans, unsuccessful at killing someone, Two that we know of, Jesus <laughs> and John, uh, couldn't kill him. Uh, they, they thought they killed Jesus, but um, he, uh, he, it didn't take. So uh, up from the grave he arose, amen. Amen. And uh, as they tried the same with, uh, with uh, John, as an old man, they probably, I don't know if the Romans had a little bit of pity, but they had pity, uh, I'm assuming, and they sent him to a prison island called Patmos, and John had this vision, this vision of revelation of how Jesus came to him and would show him all things that would be. And here uh, it starts with um, the angel sent under the church of uh, Ephesus. And there are seven churches here. I'm not, we're not diving in uh, to um, uh, this, uh, this uh, passage uh, in, in itself. What I'm doing is I'm pulling out verse 4. I'm talking about, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. The Bible says that every word of God is profitable. Every word of God is profitable. People want to put away the Old Testament and say, well, that doesn't apply to us. Sure, I'll sac sac uh, the, um, uh, the um, cultural laws and the sacrificial laws and ordinances and things like that may not apply to today. I'm not still going and killing a lamb and putting it on the, the, uh, the lentils and the, 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 door, the doorpost. Jesus did that. For us. I'm not still doing that. Yeah. But every word of God, if someone who is a fool who says, well, we're New Testament Christians, so we don't really apply the Old Testament. Okay, so we just throw away the Ten Commandments then? We just kind of sweep them under the... No, of course not. Uh, they still apply today. That's why I believe the Lord put in every word of God. Yeah. Every word of God is for our learning, for our doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for teaching. It's, it's for all of it. And so though... The angel says unto John, write this, you know, to Ephesus, I'm letting Ephesus know, um, I have sometimes probably identified as Ephesus. 
Uh, look at, he says, all your laborings and all your, your, your striving and all your work and all your patience. And folks, you ever get on a cold bus in the morning to go pick up kids for church who spill milk, who, who, who cry and have um, uh, liquids running down their face? And you ever get on a hot bus? It's even worse, hot bus, but it's a spilled milk on a hot bus. That's even worse. Uh, but uh, all the laborings, uh, youth conferences and camps and revival meetings and uh, 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 cleaning the church and maintaining the church and preparing messages. But sometimes I get caught up in the work and the work and the work and the work that I have forgotten my first love. Just when Jesus came to be with Mary and Martha and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Sitting there at Jesus' feet and Martha's running around, right? She's doing the dishes, she's sweeping, she's doing the cobwebs. She's doing everything, and she comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, yes, my wife, can, can I speak to you for a moment? He says, excuse me, Mary. Gets up and goes to see Mary, Martha, and Martha, he says, yes, Martha, what's on your mind? He already knows. He's Jesus. And she says, look at what I'm doing. Some of you are getting ready to do that on Thursday. <laughs> and I'm not trying to, I'm, listen, I, I can't stand it. I cannot stand the discord, the dissension, the bad attitude. And I get it. I get it. I've been in workplaces before where you got people doing the bulk of the work and then somebody else is in the bathroom reading the comics. Uh, I know. I know. You know, I, I, you, and, and some of y'all know, some people take lighter jobs and some take easier and you're over there doing a double portion and you're like, they better be thankful I don't choke to them to uh, Thanksgiving, I am thanks you are receiving. Uh, of course not. You know, we don't want to do that. But the Lord comes to Martha and says, what's up, Martha? And Martha says, look at I'm busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen that one thing that is needful. It's needful. It, folks, it's needful we have a clean building. It's needful the buses have fuel. It's needful the bills get paid. But, it all, but it's all in vain and it all is pointless. If we're not doing these needful things based off the foundational cornerstone that is needful, and that is a real relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Both in uh, the world of nature and in human nature, we have the ability to get over things. We have the ability to, to, to just kind of get over it. Uh, whether for good or for bad, the law of recovery is always at work. How many of you have ever had a surgery before? Any kind of surgery? Some of you are like, I didn't really get over it. You can still feel the pains, but you got over it. You got over it because you had to have another one. And the doctor said, well, you can't have this one until you're over this one. You eventually got over it. Why? Because in human nature, your body got over it. Nature, natural world, it, it got over it. Now, if you will, I want you to picture a landscape, uh, how, whether, whether it be a meadow surrounded by trees or maybe a mountain range or a, a desert of some sort. In your mind, a, a landscape, however, that was beautiful at one time, but then a flood or a tornado or a hurricane swept through and destroyed the landscape. Destroyed it. Just obliterated. Crops ruined. Trees uprooted. And we were in the, I was walking in the, the woods with Jake and one tree had fallen over, just the whole, the whole root system fell over. And it was, man, it was 12 feet tall. Just the root system, and it just, whoa, it was huge. The power that came through and just swept or knocked over that tree and those crops and, 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 and just kind of ruined everything in its wake. Wreck it all. It looks as though, in our minds, think of Hurricane Katrina. Um, we think of um, uh, 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 tornadoes that we maybe have seen with our eyes before, homes, neighborhoods, just just ripped apart by swirling winds, and we think to ourselves, whoa, that'll never be the same. Things will never be the same. But given time, given months, given time, given the hours, what begins to happen? Grass begins to grow again. Flowers begin to bloom again. And you would have never known that a disaster had passed through. You would never know that, that something horrendous had come through here. You never know. Crops begin to grow again. Trees begin to grow again. And what do you know? You never know there was a disaster. So God, the creator, he designed nature that it would do that. 
If you leave something in a field long enough, nature will reclaim it. If you leave um, a, a garden and you leave um, uh, the, the trimming and trapping around a building unattended, nature will reclaim it. If you're not constantly fighting off the weeds and the, and the fluttering leaves during fall, nature will reclaim it. That's why that God, re, God made it that way. That nature has a way of recovering itself. Man comes and puts a footprint. Nature says, you're going to fight me until the day somebody else comes along. Or until I take this place over. Nature reclaims it. Now, um, I, when I was a child, um, we as a family went to Gettysburg. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, if you look at it today, you would never, you would never know the scars that lie under the soil. Yeah, blood. The blood-soaked soil. Yeah. The 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 cannonball-scarred landscape. Bodies laying on bodies. Death and crying and tears lay all over that field. Which one day. As today, if you were to go there, it would be peaceful and serene, and quiet and very green, with a small, a still small ambiance of something sacred. Well, that was a battlefield. If you, like me, remember 9-11 and you saw how the towers went down, uh, and I don't want to hear anybody's conspiracy theories, I don't care. Come on. I just know that over 3,000 people died. Right. That our nation was attacked right. from without or from within. I don't care about your conspiracy theories. It doesn't matter to me who did it. It matters that it happened. Yeah. And for the weeks and the months and the years that left New York City and our nation scarred, if you were to go visit that place now, you wouldn't even know the two buildings were left there besides a monument. Yeah. What am I saying? I'm saying that we as a people and, and nature has a way of getting over things. Getting over it. You'll get over it. You'll get over it. Well, folks, there's one thing in this world we're never supposed to get over, and that's being saved. Come on. We're never supposed to get over being born again Amen. on our way to heaven. Amen. But man, oh man, do we get choked out. Man, oh man, does the world, the flesh, and the devil have a way of coming in, robbing us of that joy robbing us. Now, um, uh, the human race has gotten over a lot of things. Wars, uh, famines, pestilences, pandemics, and epidemics have threatened to wipe us all out. Just wipe us off the board. We'll never be the same again, some people cry. We'll never be the same again. We'll never be the same. The human race <laughs> has an astonishing, astonishing way of recovering after something bad has happened. We as individuals, we, we get over things. Some of us uh, once were um, uh, maybe on our deathbed. Maybe the doctor didn't give you much of a chance. Maybe you thought you, you would never get your life turned around. Maybe thought, man, you, you thought you'd die in your sins, riddled with disease. I've, I've seen people on their deathbed and we're here to say their last prayers. We're here to gather the family together and then they didn't die for another year. What's that all about? What's happening? I'll tell you what. The human body has a way of recovering. Yeah. It has a way of recovering. Yeah. Now, with, with um, uh, uh, hospitals, hey, they got over it. <laughs> they didn't have to be so fine-tuned in their speech and talk. They got over it. What happened to patient in room 109? They got over it. What happened to, what happened to all those uh, 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 healthy people that had COVID? They got over it. What happened to the person that had the flu for it? They got over it. They got over it. They got, now, bless God, you might be fighting something new today, but if you just hang on and you don't quit, you'll get over it. You'll get over it. Now, for God's omnipotent resources, um, he is a great restorer. That's why I love the story of redemption. That God made man in his image. Mankind was deceived, duped, lied to, deceived by Satan. And God said, I'll do whatever it takes to buy mankind back. I love the redemption story. So not only is God the great physician and a great um, a, 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 a redeemer, he's a great restorer. He's a great restorer. He can take, now I, I, this old, um, our old family vehicle, I, I got a can of spray paint that matches the same color as the vehicle. Spray that, spray it. I don't know body work. 
but I know spray paint, amen. Um, <coughs> I can spray that there. And I look at that, and, and, and I have sentimental value. I'm going to drive it until it dies, amen. Nico said, I'll buy it for you. Nope, nope. I'm going to drive it, drive it until it goes, please stop driving. Uh, I'm just going to drive it until it dies, <coughs> or until Jamie makes me buy her a new car. But uh, uh, God's a great restorer. And I look at that vehicle, and I go, man, aren't, how does that, that, that shows our life. I love to used to watch a, a show called Overhauling uh, with a guy named Chip Foose where they take cars and, and, and classic cars that maybe they, they didn't have their, they'd seen their better days. And he'd take them and he'd restore them and make them invaluable. Mm -hmm. Make them incredible again. Yeah. We don't think God can save our eternal soul, but he can't fix up our life. Sure he can. Sure he can. And not only can he, but he wants to. Right. He wants to. Uh, God has omnipotent, uh, in his omnipotent uh, uh, omniscience, has the resources to restore us. And the moment you hurt, listen, our bodies, the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The moment you scratch your finger, the moment you prick yourself or stab yourself or whatever the case, you injure yourself, your body has a 911 system all of its own to immediately rush to the place of that trauma and start restoring. If you'll let it. God designed us that way. God made us that way to be able to recover. To be able to recover. Now, we are always getting over things. Babies, how precious babies are. But isn't it a good thing that they get over being babies? <laughs> isn't it a good thing that babies don't stay babies, but they grow up? No, we're like, man, I wish they'd stay babies because diapers are less expensive than what it is that they require now. Uh, I admit, babies are great. You know, we have Deacons one and a half, and we've got a baby girl on the way. Um, babies are great. I like babies. Um, my babies, anyway. You, can, you have yours. I'll have mine. You like yours. I like mine. Uh, it's, it's just how it works. Um, uh, but, of course, I mean, I like they get to ages where there's so much fun. You know, we have so much fun with these kids. But it's a good thing that they grow up. It's a wonderful thing that they grow up. But um, uh, uh, someone once said, when a man grows up, but doesn't grow up, he is a fool. A lot of trouble is caused by people who don't grow up. They look normal. They would resent being called a big baby. They resent that. Don't call me a big baby. Don't you know I can, I can drive a car? It doesn't mean anything. Don't you know I can vote? That, that really doesn't know I'm telling you anything. Don't you know that I can buy cigarettes? I can buy a gun? I can carry a gun? No, it doesn't say anything because a bunch of big babies are carrying guns and smoking cigarettes and voting for morons right. and right. driving cars. They look normal. They look normal. But if you said that they had arrested development, they would resent you. But they make others miserable with their childish behaviors, their childish traits, their childish tantrums, that they should have outgrown these things long ago. This is what Peter and Paul talked to us about. Growing in grace and being on sincere milk of the word. But he would have, he'd rather have them on meat and potatoes. He said, I'd rather feed you with spiritual meat. But i got to continue to give you milk. Because you won't grow up. Grow up. Grow up, he says to the churches. Grow up. Stop being childlike and grow up. So if some middle agers dressed according to their dispositions, they would still be wearing diapers and having binkies and bibs. If some folks still, if we dressed the way we behaved, it, we would be ashamed. Now, the law of recovery works both ways. While we get over things, we should, and we should get over them, many people start out on their, their, their chosen careers with high ideals, high dreams, big goals, and then we just kind of let it die. We just kind of, we get caught up in the monotony. You know, you started off wanting to go to school to become a whatever, and when you got in and you got the classes, you just kind of let it die a little bit. You started off wanting to be going to business school. You started off creating a business. You started off oh, thinking marriage. Oh, marriage, wonderful, wonderful. And then you just kind of got used to it. You just kind of got over it. You just got over getting married. You got over getting your career. You got over having kids. You got over getting saved. You got over being bought again. You got over uh, uh, achieving your college degree. You got over it. You got over it. You got over it. Why? That's human nature. But there's a way to keep it alive. 
There's a way to revive it again. We have that song, revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Why? Because mankind get over it. We get over the Bible. We do, we, remember that one great preacher or that one great sermon preacher preached that one time? Yeah, it was so great, we forgot it. Remember that one time you got that one person led to the Lord and then it changed you for a month or two or three and then you got over it. Remember that one convert, that one family member you brought to church and they walked the aisle and they said, Dear God in heaven, I'm a sinner. I know that if I died in my sins, I'd die and go to hell. But I don't want to go to hell. So right now, the best I know how, I believe on Jesus Christ. I believe that he's the Savior. And I'm not saying it's some big prayer. Amen. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And I can't save myself. He is my advocate. He is my propitiation. And I need him to save me because I can't do it on my own. And Jesus Christ comes to live. Woo! How wonderful that is. And then we get over it. Man, the bus was full today. And then we got over it. Man, the choir was great today. And then we got over it. Wow, the kids did a great job today. And then we got over it. It's the law of getting over it. Getting over it. Yet how do you keep it fresh? What do you do to keep it fresh? The Bible says not to lose the joy of our salvation. Not to lose the joy of it. Man, the wonder of it. You just take, take some time out of your day. Every day, every other day. And you just go ahead and think about hell for a few minutes. You just go ahead and think about, man, I could be in hell if not for the grace of God. That one time that I was seconds away from getting T-boned in an intersection and I was two seconds late. That one thing that helped me up, that one thing that held me up, I could be in hell right now. But by the grace of God, I'm not. Man, you go ahead and think about hell for a minute. Think about the millions and the billions that are burning in the deep pits of hell right now this morning who will never get out, who don't have a chance of getting out. They're there forever, never to get out, died in their sins because they rejected the Savior, did not believe on Him, rejected Him, used His name in vain, and said, No, God. God said, I am not willing that any would perish. But that all would come to repentance. Hey. Even those who, um, even those who would defy me, even those who would reject me, I don't want them to go to hell. So therefore, I've made a way through my Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we take these all these things into account and go, Wow, okay, great. I'm not on my way to hell. So what does that mean? I'm at a standstill. I'm just kind of cruising through life. No. Bless God, I'm going to heaven. We talked about it on the bus this morning with Brother Ari. Guess what, folks? No seizures in heaven. Amen. No, no nearsightedness or farsightedness in heaven. No canes in heaven. No waters in heaven. No cemeteries in heaven. Oh, no uh, no, no uh, foster care yeah, in heaven. Man. Bless God, you're in the presence of the Almighty. Yes, you're in the Lord. presence of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, if you, can, if you can take just a couple of minutes and think about hell and not be glad about your salvation, or think about heaven and not be glad and joyful about your salvation, then you, I don't know if you're saved. Amen. There's no way you can sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Folks, every, the Bible says every knee shall bow. I don't know how it's all going to work out, but Jesus Christ is going to have a crowning day and we're all going to bow the knee, amen. We might even, even end up like this. Amen. Oh, my God. Oh, God, I should have done more. Oh, God, why was not more? Oh, God, you saved me from going to hell, and I consumed it upon my own lust. I took the salvation of Jesus Christ and said, cool, I got the eternal ticket punch, and I didn't do jack squat for Jesus the rest of my life. Shame on me. Shame on me. And shame on Christians who think and feel that way. Now, I don't know man's hearts, but he does, and I have a responsibility from on high to speak and preach the word of God as it's written and not tiptoe around the titles. That's right. And I don't ever, I don't ever want to get over being saved. I don't ever want to get over being a child of God. And I don't want Three Rivers Baptist Church to ever get over it. I want people to come in here and go, we don't know if they're right or not, but they sure seem happy about being saved. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We, don't, we were raised differently. We were trained differently. But they really believe what they believe. And I'm not talking about a bunch of, bunch of crazed uh, zealots that don't identify with mankind. I'm not talking about a bunch of zealots who are um, uh, 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 bashful 
and um, uh, not wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but bold as lions, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. People who are confident, like Paul said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What have I committed unto him? My eternal soul. I don't ever, I don't ever, no, not ever, want to get over being saved. Hey, I may, I, I may backslide. I may backslide. But I promise you one thing that's going to keep me away from backsliding is going... Glory I'm saved, glory I'm saved, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Glory I'm saved, glory I'm saved. Uh, so help me out. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified lamb, or one. Uh, and then there's um, uh, and there's so many. There's so many. Uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs are there. How about, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Where there is no shed blood, there is no remission of sins. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross for nothing. It was for something, and it was for my sins and your sins alike. The Bible says that he died on the cross not for my sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Oh. Anybody that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I don't ever want to get over being saved. I told the kids yesterday where they were saying, you should have heard them yesterday, the doxology. Praise God for Sins Praise God. <laughs> sad. It was sad. I said, folks, you, you can sing that song with reverence and with happiness. You can sing it because there's a song in your heart. And the more that you think about being saved, being saved, what does that even mean? Being saved, saved from my own sins, saved from dying and going to hell, that I get to go to heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ, born again. Like, Jesus saved me. Yeah, he'll say to you, uh, anybody, for whosoever shall call, amen, whosoever, I love that verse, one of my favorites, for whosoever, anybody, shall call. I don't want to get over being saved. And the more that you'll think about your salvation, the less you'll get over it. You'll never, this Ephesians, uh, uh, this Ephesus won't apply to you. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. If the Lord has something against me, I want it to be anything besides having left his love. Amen. Now, Jesus said, if you take all the law and the prophets, and hang all the law, all the law. I mean, like every word, besides the words, these commands that were given, Jesus said, take all the law and the prophets, every, every sermon, every word, every prophecy, everything that they did, and hang them on these two commands. Love God with all your heart, mind, mind and soul, or your strength. Love God with all your being, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then you won't leave your first love. If you love God, this won't apply to you. You'll be able to go throughout your life and go, man, isn't God good? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? I was listening to a, a, a message from my brother Jack Kyle. It's called, Being Thankful for That Which I Am Not Thankful. Being Thankful for That Which I Am Not Thankful. Don't listen to it because I'm going to modify it and preach it. Um, but, uh, it's good, man. It was good. I go through life going, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. For all things, and we know, all things, all things, there's that word again, Crystal, all, all things to all people. And we know all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them were the call according to his purpose. And if you say, look, folks, let's just take out being that, let's take being perfect out of the equation, okay? Nobody in this room is perfect. We are all daily. Daily sinners, which means we need to daily repent. Ugh. I know people get scared of that word. Repent, what does it mean? I mean, go to God and go, God, I was wrong. Please help me. Right. That's what I mean by repent. Yeah, change man. your mind. Change, change your mind about the way you live. Change your actions towards the one who saved you. Yeah. Amen? Okay, so now that we have that under control, uh, 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 that into equation here, nobody's perfect. Take that into the equation and say, I love the Lord. I love him because he loved me. I love the Lord because Jesus Christ died for me. He sent his son to die for me. He saved me. He shed his blood for me. What he did on the cross for me was unfathomable. And he did it for me. 
and he ascended back on high, and he gave me a book full of promises that he said, if you will, then I will, and where you are, there, or where I am, there you may be also. I go and prepare a place for you. I'm, do I'm doing that, take that into account. So you're not perfect, yes, I'm, but are you an unrepentant, rebellious, backslidden, hard-hearted, a cold sinner who says, and to the things of God? Or you say, dear God, I'm, help me, help me, Father. Dear God, let, make, your light, make your word a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not a man that walketh to direct his steps. O oh, Heavenly Father, would you lead me today? Help me to be the best father I can be today. Help me to be patient where I need to be with my kids and stern where I need to be with my kids. Heavenly Father, help me to be the kind of father with my children that you are the father towards me. Heavenly Father, help me to be the right kind of spouse. Help me to lead. Help me to help. Help me to do. Help me to say. Help me to be the encourager that I need to be. Help me, Heavenly Father. I can't do it without you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I can't do it on my own power. Philippians 4.13 says we can do, oh, here it is again. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Right. Okay, if we'll just put God at the head of all that we do, even in the valley of the shadow of death, leave him in charge. You be able to walk out with head up, shoulders up, chest up, saying, "Woo!" And God good. Did you see what God did? You woke me. Did you believe God did this morning? Man, I woke up this morning. I got up at three. I woke up at three o eight. Before I didn't set the alarm on purpose. I've been having some testing with the Lord because I felt sort of, Lord, are you there? <laughs> are you there, Lord? I said, Lord, I'm not going to set my alarm. He said, Lord, if you want to talk to me this morning. Uh, I want you to wake me up. 5 p.m. or 5 a.m. <laughs> I said, 5 a.m. is good. He said, how about 3.08 in the morning? I woke up at 3.08 and went, nah, this is the Lord. <laughs> I got up at 3.15. No, nah. I said, no, I, no, folks, you know the flesh. You're under the warm covers. And I said, no, I'm, no. I got up at 3.15, grabbed my Bible. Didn't even open it. I prayed for like three hours. Mostly just saying, dear God, dear God, dear God. Oh God, help. Oh God, help. Oh God. Preaching, it's serious, and souls are on the line, and baptisms, and young lives, and married couples, and friends, and oh God, help! Guess what? Guess what? God helps. God has a way of showing up. But as I sat there, I looked around my house and went, wow. I don't know, just a few months ago, I was living in the church basement. Wow. God answers prayers. Amen. And by the way, this isn't some of that prosperity garbage gospel. No, this God, God will give you what you need. God will provide all your need. God will provide it. If you're giving, if you're taking from God, God's not just going to go keep giving. you got to give to God, and he will give, and he will supply. He will give, and he will supply. But I don't ever, I don't ever want to get over where we live. I don't ever, I man, that's that old Escalade we have 224,000 miles on it. Bob wrecked it, Jamie wrecked it, bashing into trees and stuff with the bumper. I still look at that thing and go, it's the prettiest rust bucket we have. <laughs> Why? Because that was a turning point for us. God bless, man, we went from the, the Marshkeys gave us a van that a tree fell on. Bless God, it was a blessing we needed it. I had another van for my brother. I thought it was electric doors on the side, you know, but they're censored. And every time it would almost close, it would go, psych, and open up. So, after a while, I just, boom, kick that thing in. Take that forward. Um, uh, but, but, hey, it was a blessing. We needed vehicles God provided. It was, we had them. And then, man, through faithfulness and through um, uh, the love of uh, 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 my parents in this church, and so many, we've been blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. I laid there on that, uh, that, uh, that couch as I got up this morning. I was laying there watching a beautiful orange and yellow sunrise come up. And the Lord said, hey, remember when you got this house and you saw that driveway? And that's, you prayed for a long driveway? I said, yes, sir. Yes, Lord. He said, how about you use it a little bit more often? You prayed for it. You got it. When, before we got the home, when we were talking to the owner, we pulled out and I stopped. Whoa. And I looked down that driveway and I went, I was praying for a long drive. 
And the Lord, the Lord said, yeah, you didn't realize you had to plow a long time. Wait. <laughs> That's why I have sons. Those shovels, boys. Uh, give them some spoons. Go outside. Uh, <laughs> but I look at that and go, whoa, whoa. She said, Brother Jake, what are you getting at? I'm saying, you pray for things. We receive things. Don't get over receiving what you pray for. So many people make deals with God. God, if you'll get me out of this bind, I promise I'll do X, Y, Z. God gets us out of the bind. No, we one won't do X, Y, Z. Because he loves us. I don't ever want to get over being saved. I don't ever want to get over it. We shouldn't get over it. A lot of old-time pastors grow, grow bitter. They grow sour. I've heard war stories of pastors and ministers and preachers and evangelists and missionaries. They started out Bright fire shining for God. But then they saw so much evil. They saw so much drama of the heart of men. Like God says in his word. They became disappointed in men that they once trusted. They had the spirit inside of them quenched. Until they became uh, human uh, uh, wet blankets. So here is this old grouchy pastor. Here's this young pastor. Oh, I'm going to do something for God. And the young the old pastor comes along and goes. Psh. No, you won't. No, you won't. No, you can't. Folks, did anybody ever tell you, if you know, if you know, if you know without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, has called you. Has called you. Don't let somebody who's not living for God tell you you can't. Right. Don't let some, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scorner, or sitteth in the seat of the, uh, standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. If you are in the way of the Lord, trying to do something for the Lord, and somebody is out of the way of the Lord, trying to tell you you can't do something for the Lord, let them be anathema. You just tune them out, turn the tunes up high for Jesus, and keep on trucking. Keep on going for Jesus. Don't anybody ever tell you that you can. So, as I close here, Jesus said in Matthew 18.3, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I'm sure that there's one thing he meant for us to see. Is I've been thinking a lot about childlike belief lately. One thing that he wanted us to see is that uh, that children have not become used to living. Children have not become used to the dangers and the spoils and the, the uh, uh, destruction and depression of living. Children still laugh and play and giggle and have fun and run. I am somewhat jealous of children. Because we've become so old and so dignified that we, revival doesn't affect us anymore. That there are no other name but the name of Jesus. No other name but the name of the Lord. We just kind of, eh. Folks, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. His name above every name. And we get over it. I've got a home in heaven. Am I over it? Are we over it? Folks, let's not get over it. Let's, let's, let's kind of let's kick it up a notch. We're in the last days. All right, well, then let's like, like, do something. Right. right. Like, join a bus ride. Yeah. Like, welcome the kids in from the buses. Become a teacher's aide. Become a teacher. Work in the nursery. You can't be the pastor. Though. There's already one of those. <laughs> uh, so join the choir. No, no, folks, there, there's, there's uh, requirements. There's requirements that come with these things, like faithfulness, like living for Jesus, like trying to put things away in your life that things I used to do, I still occasionally do them. No, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Why? Because there's been a great change since I've been born again, since I started believing and living for Jesus. Now, I want you to think, modernism and worldliness are not the only evils that have crept into the church. Modernism, the modern church, yeah, whatever. Uh, 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 communism, worldliness, uh, liberalism, Marxism, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. Jesusism, amen. Come on. Jesus. Amen. Jesus. So we individual Christians, we get over it. We leave our first love. We lose the joy of our salvation. 
and we get to where grace doesn't, it just doesn't appear as precious as it once first did. That's what happens. We become, um, well, one pastor said, we become as a fountain of water that gives life, that gives refreshing, but never tastes it. We can't do that. We can't do that. It's not necessary. It isn't necessary for us to fall into heresy or to go into modernism or into worldliness as a church to get over it. We may believe the truth, stand for the truth, and yet the very activities of the truth we do and we grow accustomed to it that we never are changed by it. So whether church or preacher, layman or pastor, no matter who it is, let's be attentive to our salvation. Think of it. Can somebody tell me this morning, you know when you got saved? Somebody tell me, Brother Pitt? November 1996. November 1996. Ms. White? Easter 1971. Easter 1971. Somebody else? Houston? Uh, June 2017. Ms. Marshall? February 27, 1999. Ms. Sarah? August 1990. February 4, 2001. Somebody else? Anybody else? I'll take just a couple more. Ms. Jesse? January 7, 1997. Huh? Now, if you don't have a day, you can have a day. Oh, who's January, that, Stefan? January 21st, 2009. Amen. <laughs> hey, whosoever will may come. If you've never called on the name of the Lord, today's the day. If you haven't called in a while, today's the day to get it right with the Lord. Say, Lord, thank you for saving me. I haven't told you in a while. <laughs> thank you for saving me. So, let's not be unresponsive. Let's not just kind of write this off as another what we filled in our Sunday checklist. Right. But man, let's think about being born again Amen. on our way to heaven. Let's not get over it like Gettysburg, like 9-11, like a landscape that's uh, devastated by a natural disaster. Let's not get over it. Let's not look up. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Folks, we better get back to it for all, our, all of our activity. It's useless, it's vain, if we lose our first love. It amounts to in being in need of a personal revival. Personal revival. Folks, are you in need of a personal revival today? Do you say, man, I, I've just been going through the motions. I, I know that I've been saved and I've not thought about it. I've not thanked the Lord for Jesus. I've not thought about the cross. I've not thought about resurrection. The Lord hasn't written you off. Talk about it in Sunday school. What, what happens when a Christian sins? What happens when a Christian sins? Well, God doesn't disown you. You're part of the family of God. But it sure breaks fellowship. You cannot, we cannot get all that we can get out from God and be for God. If we let sin unconfessed get in the way. Not thanking God. That's, just, that's sin. 